much for that, our music team, and of course, thank you to all those who make these services possible. And it is a joy to bring God's Word to you this morning and uh, to share with you uh, this Easter message. I would invite you, if possible, if you can, if you have a Bible, uh, to turn with me to the book of John, chapter 11, uh, the passage that was read earlier. And uh, I would like to continue on. Uh, Ken read the, uh, the beginning of the story, and I would like to read the rest of the story as we launch into this Easter message that I've entitled, The Full Picture of the Resurrection. We finished at verse 25 earlier, and so we'll pick up at verse 26, and we'll read down to verse 44, and I invite you to follow along. Verse 26 says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when she said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she had heard this, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench for he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, do not, did I not say to you that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and with his face wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Well, in many ways, it grieves us that we're not able to worship together on this, the most significant day in all of the Christian calendar. I hope that today's message will bring life and joy into your heart as we consider the full picture of the resurrection of Christ. I want to begin my my sermon this morning by giving to you a a premise that I want to really flesh out and look at for the rest of our service here today. A premise, a proposition, a statement that I think we need to consider and I think that is very important for us to think about. And the statement is this, the premise is this, is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most significant and important event in all of human history. It's the most significant and important event in all of human history. And not only is the resurrection the very foundation of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Christ is actually the the centerpiece of history. It's the crown jewel of, of God's redemptive plan for mankind. You know, all that we see going on in the world today, and and man, we are living in some strange times, and all that we have seen affect and impact the world in terms of this virus, uh, as tragic and as unique and as significant as this current event is, really, if you think about it, all of what's happening today is, in fact, a part of the, the natural world. I don't want to make light of anything that's going on, and I know that it is very serious and many people are affected, but viruses and sickness and, and death, all of these things are, are actually part of the natural world. We see viruses that have brought sickness and death throughout all of human history, and even without this one, there are many that affect people on a day-to-day life. Day-to-day, uh, life. 
But the resurrection is supernatural. The resurrection is something that has only ever occurred once in all of human history. Someone being dead for three days to once again have breath in their lungs, to have blood throwing, flowing through their veins, and for all of their systems to be working as if they were prior to their death, now operating fully, in full function, someone who was dead now being brought back to life. That, my friends, is the most important event in all of human history. And while our world now shuts down in many ways and hides in fear and uncertainty and uh, our lives have been turned upside down and many of the things that we loved and cherished and, and valued and, and held dear have been temporarily at least taken away, I, I want us to really just take some time and consider this event and the significance that it has for you and for me and for our world. And I would implore you to consider this, this morning with me why this premise is true. Now to give some context to this whole premise and this whole idea and this whole theme of the resurrection, I'm using John chapter 11 as kind of a reference for much of my sermon this morning. And so this brings us to the next point and that is the problem of the resurrection. The problem that the resurrection came to actually solve or to deal with. In this passage here, in John chapter 11, we see that Jesus and his disciples receive word that their friend Lazarus is sick, but not just a normal sickness, he's sick unto death. But Jesus, who has the power and has already shown that he can heal the sick, does not rush to the bedside of his friend. He stays where he is. He doesn't go to meet Lazarus and to heal him and to stop him from dying, he waits. Now, if you think about it, this is quite strange to the disciples. They've seen him heal strangers. They've seen him uh, uh, touch blind people that he, he didn't know personally. Of course, he knew him as the omniscient God, but he didn't know them personally. But Lazarus is a close friend. You would think of all people that Jesus would have rushed to his side. Or he didn't even need to be there. We know that he could have spoken the word from where he was and Lazarus could have been healed. That's the power that Jesus had as the God man. But he doesn't do that. He stays and he waits. And after two days, the Bible says that he tells his disciples that he's going to go and travel to Bethany to wake Lazarus up. Now the disciples are confused about this. They don't understand what he's saying and they, they, they think that, they, that he's saying that Lazarus is asleep and he's uh, sleeping from sickness and Jesus is going to heal his sickness and wake him up out of his slumber and out of his uh, sleep from being sick. But that is not the problem that Jesus goes to solve. And I love how Jesus speaks very plainly to his disciples in verse 14 because they don't quite get it. He says to them very plainly, no, 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 Lazarus is dead. He's not sick anymore, he's dead. You would have thought that that would have been the finality for Lazarus. You would have thought that that would have been the end of his journey here on earth. And yet Jesus says, I've waited till he is dead and now I'm gonna go to him. You see, that is the problem that the resurrection solve. That's the only problem that resurrections solve. People who are sick do not need a resurrection. They need healing. But people who are dead need a resurrection. They don't need medicine. You can't give a dead person medicine. You can't give them ointment or, uh, or healing. They're dead. They need new life. So death is the problem. You know, this illustrates to us and reminds us that Really, this is the, the greatest of all problems of humanity. You see, the resurrection of Christ and even the resurrection of Lazarus here is not just simply some cool miracle that Jesus performed to, to show how powerful he is. But the resurrection of Jesus is actually the remedy to our greatest problem, the problem of death. You know, Jesus pronounces Lazarus dead here in John chapter 11, verse 14. Lazarus is dead. You know, the Bible actually pronounces every single one of us, myself included, in the exact same way. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead 
in trespasses and sins. The Bible describes our spiritual condition uh, when we are born into this world as having death passed upon to all of us. Sin and death passes on. That's the one thing that, that is common amongst all of us. You may have different genetics and, and different eye color and hair color and height and weight and all of these types of things. But the one thing that unites every single human being is that we are born with death upon us. I know that doesn't sound very nice and we don't like to think of it that way, but that's just the reality. And the Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean? You know, I, I think that most people, most people have a sense that there is something wrong with themselves. I think we're all pretty aware with that. We know that we're not what we ought to be. We, we can see maybe some faults in our character and in our lives. And maybe we can see that, uh, you know, we haven't amounted to the person that we know we ought to be. We know that there's something wrong with us. But do we actually realize that the problem is not that we are just simply sick with trespasses and sins, but that in terms of our inner being, the Bible says we are actually spiritually dead. What does this mean? This means that we are all born under the power and the presence of sin and death. Sin affects and infects every single part of our being. Our minds are bent towards sin. Our emotions respond sinfully to circumstances. We respond with anger and anxiety and, and, uh, and hatred and jealousy and all of these horrible things which, which impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. Our, our will, our decision-making is bent towards sin. We all have a bent towards sin, not towards righteousness. You know how I know this, and we all know this. If anyone who has children knows that you never have to teach a child to do wrong. I've had lots of conversations with my kids. I have never had to instruct them how to lie, how to get angry, how to hit, how to hurt, and how to do evil. It's natural, and it was natural for me. And then, of course, our body is affected by sin and death. None of us live forever. Our bodies, regardless of how, will one day die. You see, I don't think we fully grasp this concept. And this is our problem. This is why we don't run to the, to the resurrected Christ because we don't actually think that we are dead. But this is the pronouncement that Jesus made on Lazarus and that the Bible makes upon us. We are unable in and of ourselves to do anything which brings glory and, 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 and honor to our God because we are under sin's power and presence. And just like Lazarus lacked any ability in himself to get up out of that tomb and come back to life, you and I have no ability nor even a desire. The Bible says there is none who seeks after God. No, not one. We don't desire to love him or obey him. And this problem of sin and death, which was brought into the world by man, can only be solved by God. No man can solve this problem of death and sin. Only God can solve this problem. Which brings me to the next point, and that's the, the promise of the resurrection. Because as sin and death came into this world by one man, that man being Adam, the, the uh, representative of all mankind, the first man that God made, and as Adam and Eve sinned and plunged the entire human race into sin, do you know what's interesting is that God's first act, after he confronts Adam and Eve, is that he pronounces and pronounces judgment upon them and upon Satan who tempted them. His first act was to bring a promise. Genesis chapter three, verse 15, the first promise in all of the scriptures concerning a savior, concerning a Messiah, that there would come someone from the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, who would defeat death. And then from, from there on, from Genesis three fifteen all the way through, we see God revealing and promising that one day there would be a savior who he sends and God's redemptive plan unfolds uh, through his people, the Jews, until it's fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And even though it's in some ways veiled, the resurrection is promised throughout the Old Testament. For example, Isaiah 53, we read that 
passage on our Good Friday service explicitly speaks that the Messiah would come and he would be a suffering and a dying Messiah who would die for the sins of his people and he would take our sins upon himself and he, would, uh, he was bruised for our iniquities and so on. And yet in verse 10, after it speaks of him being the, the suffering and the dying Savior, it says that he shall see his and he shall prolong his days. Psalm verse 16, chapter 16, verse 10 says of this Messiah, a messianic psalm in, uh, that many believe, says, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol or the place of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One, which is a title only given to the Messiah, it's a messianic title, neither will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. The prophet Jonah, of course, is, a, is an illustration that Jesus even uses of the resurrection. As Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, so too must the Son of Man be three days in the grave. And then the prophet Hosea, chapter 13, verse 15, says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. You see, God even though there was a great problem, promised a savior who not only dies for our punishment, who takes our sin upon himself, but actually rises again and removes that greatest problem, the problem of sin and death. But who could do such a thing? I mean, who could, who could actually fulfill this promise? And that brings us to the person of the resurrection. Back to our story here in John chapter 11. Martha who was one of Lazarus' sisters, when she finally meets Jesus, as Jesus travels to Bethany and she, she meets up with him outside of the actual town, she's perplexed at why Jesus waited. She doesn't understand why Jesus chose to stay away because she, she believed that Jesus could have healed him. She knew even that she would see Lazarus again on the resurrection. Jesus said to her, he said, your brother will rise again. And she said, yeah, I, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection. In other words, I know that I will see him in eternity. But then Jesus makes a statement. And this statement is so profound that it can only mean one of three things. By making this statement, Jesus is either a flat-out liar, he is a full-on lunatic, or he is, in fact, the Lord. He says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. You see, there is only one person, one, just one, who has the power over death itself. Only one person in history who has ever or will ever rise again from the dead on their own power. Earlier in John, Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I have power, I have authority to lay down my life and I have the power and the authority to take it up again. No man can do what I can do. You see, he was not just simply an ordinary man. No ordinary man could defeat death. And as Jesus walks to the tomb of Lazarus, consider this that they roll the stone away and by the power of his word commands death to flee. As he cries out, Lazarus, come forth. Think about this for a moment. The same God who commanded light to shine in the darkness and the same God who commanded the storms and the waves to cease and the weather obeyed him commands death to depart from Lazarus. And death has no option but to obey Lord, the Lord. You see, the grave and the tomb could not hold our Lord Jesus Christ. Sin had no power over him. Death had no authority over him. Three days after Jesus was crucified, he literally, bodily, actually rose again. The one who was dead is now alive. And he was as alive as he was before he died. Do I really believe this? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Why? Because of the proofs of the resurrection. You see, this 
this story, this Easter story that we celebrate every single year, this is, is not a, a mere story of some kind of Christian mythology. This is not just some lovely story that we decided to make up because it gives us a holiday to celebrate or gives us a reason to celebrate. We actually, Christians actually believe that Jesus died and rose again. In fact, our entire faith rests upon the truth that Jesus actually did this. I mean, even the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament, said of the fact of the resurrection that if Christ did not rise, our preaching is in vain. It's empty. It's pointless. There's literally no reason to gather as Christians on, on, on Sunday. There's no reason. That you can't even be a Christian. Without the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, God gives us and he, and he shows us, and we're not going to spend much time on this, but he, he, he tells us that there's evidence of the resurrection. He says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. And after that, he was seen of James. And then the last, he was seen by me. That's the Apostle Paul also. Consider the evidences or the proofs of the resurrection. First of all, of course, the scriptures are the greatest testament of the resurrection. The authority and the authenticity of the New Testament has been tested beyond uh, all other tests that have, ever, have ever come across any ancient document in our history. But then there's, another, there's other proofs of the resurrection or evidences of the resurrection. The very fact that the first people to see Jesus alive were in fact women, not mentioned here in 1 Corinthians, but all the gospels have the women coming to the tomb first. You say, why is that significant? Because if you were trying to create a resurrection story in first century uh, uh, Middle East, the first century in the Middle East, and you wanted people to believe your story, whether we like it or not, the fact is that women were not given any, hardly any credibility in a court or as a testimony uh, as they are today. You wouldn't have written that into the story because no one would have believed it. But then there's the appearances to the, the disciples. Think about the disciples. Peter, who none of them believed. They all fled away when Jesus was being crucified. They didn't believe that he was going to rise again. They were skeptics. They'd heard him say it over and over again, but they never really grasped what he was saying. And yet after the resurrection, every single one of his 12 followers, barring Judas, of course, died and was martyred for their belief that they had actually seen the resurrected Christ then there's the 500 people at once. That's a lot of people to sort of come and make up some big story or some mass hysteria. That just doesn't happen. A friend of mine always used to say, that's, that's over a thousand eyeballs saw Jesus alive after he rose again from the dead. And then it says of his brother G James, his brother, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, I, I think about this a lot, you know, of anybody uh, who would have known who Jesus was and would have had been somewhat skeptical about Jesus, don't you think a younger brother would have been a little bit, you know, yeah, I know who this Jesus is. I, I grew up with him. Uh, don't you think he would have been the first one to kind of be a little bit hesitant to follow Jesus? And yet even James was beheaded because he believed that his brother, his half-brother Jesus, rose again from the dead. Then the apostle Paul who was not always the Apostle Paul. At one point, he was Saul of Tarsus, the great persecutor and hater of Christians, who did everything he could and made it his life missions to eradicate Christianity from the land. And yet he is the writer of 13 books of the New Testament. Because he said that Jesus appeared to him, the resurrected Christ appeared to him and knocked him off of his high horse, literally and figuratively, and turned his life around until he became the most staunch, avid preacher of the resurrected Christ. And then if you think about it, the very existence of the church itself. You see, Christianity does not stand. True biblical Christianity does not stand and does not survive and does not flourish on fear and threat and law. But it survives and flourishes 
with a people who believe and preach and love and have accepted the resurrected Christ. You see, churches, any church that begins to deny the literal resurrection of Christ, they never survive. Because there's no reason to gather. There's no reason to be together if Christ is not risen, as Paul said. So yes, I, I believe. I believe that Jesus actually rose again from the dead. But we need to ask ourselves why, don't we? Why did Jesus do this? This brings us to the purpose of the resurrection. In our story here in John chapter 11, Jesus tells his disciples why he waited. He said that God was going to be glorified in this event. God was going to receive glory and he was going to receive glory. The son of God was going to receive glory. And as Jesus stood at that tomb and called out with that loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The one who was dead was now made alive. Do you remember the problem? The problem is that all of us are dead in trespasses and sins. We're, we're born this way. We are born, as they say, dead on arrival. None of us inherit spiritual life from our parents. It doesn't matter if you were born to, the, to the, the, the poorest of the poor, the richest of the rich, or the most religious of the religious. All of us inherit the sin nature that Adam passed down to each and every one of us, and so all of us have this pronouncement of death upon us. All of us are, are dead. But Ephesians chapter 2 continues, and I want you to listen as I read just this passage. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, and you he made alive, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we, ha we, co we conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just as others. That's not a very nice thing to think about, but that's us, that's me, that's you. Uh, if you have not received Christ, he says, you, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the lusts of your flesh. You did as you pleased, you, you served as you pleased, pleased and you, you, you did whatever you wanted to do, and you lived for yourself. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. No power over sin. No, no power to, to defeat sin. It was, it was a powerful over you. That's the diagnosis. But then the two most blessed words in all of scripture. But God. But God. Who is rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Jesus said God was going to be glorified in, in this event here in John 11. But even greater, God is glorified in the resurrected Christ. Because it is the resurrected Christ that imparts his eternal life to those who believe. And we will forever be together to the praise and the glory of his grace. You see, as great a miracle as it was to bring Lazarus back to life, for a body that was once dead now to be alive, that, that's, a, that's a pretty amazing miracle. I mean, I think that probably trumps almost even all the other miracles that Jesus did. As great a miracle as it was for a body to come back to life, there is no greater miracle that God performs than the salvation and the transformation of a sinner like you and me. It's almost, it's almost inexplicable. But 
God. The two most glorious words in all of scripture. Jesus told Martha, he said, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? See, when a person is saved, the Bible describes it as being born again, new life. God calls that person to life. And that same God that breathed life into that dust, formed dust and made Adam and breathed life into him and in the beginning, he calls dead men and women to eternal life. And so it is because of the resurrection of Jesus that I stand before you and am saved. You see, I had no interest in God, no hunger for righteousness, no hatred for sin. And I even grew up in a, in a I guess you would say, religious and a Christian home. No desire for God, yet by his mercy and only his mercy and grace, he called me to himself and he is calling you now. Do you believe this? Which brings us to the power of the resurrection. How can I know that I have this new life? It's a power. Philippians 3.10, Paul says, I desire to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. How do we know we have eternal life? Well, he regenerates our hearts. He gives us a new heart. He replaces our affections. The things that I once loved, I hate. The things that I once hated, now I love. And he removes the fear of death. That's what Paul says. He says, I've counted all things but, but waste, but rubbish, but dung, that I may win Christ. Death didn't even scare him because he had this eternal life living inside of him. But we can't go any further without talking about the penalty of the resurrection. Jesus said to those who believe, there is eternal life. There is eternal life to those who believe. So that should beg us to answer the question, or at least ask the question, what of those who, who do not believe? If life is given to those who believe, what is given to those who do not believe? The prophet Daniel, chapter 12, verse 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That prophecy was given hundreds of years before Christ even came. And then in the final book of Revelation, which tells us of the things to come, the word of God says in Revelation 20, verse 11, verses to 15, that there's coming a day that the dead will stand before God in judgment. And all who are not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast off into the lake of fire, and the Bible calls this the second death. You see, death is not merely a problem. It's a, it's a pronouncement of God. And not one person will stand before this God who, who judges all things righteously and rightly. Not one person will be cast off who does not deserve that judgment. All of us fall short of the glory of God. So to those who do not believe, there, there is a penalty. And it would be remiss of me to not warn you and remind you of that penalty because that's the very reason why Christ came. If there was no problem of sin, there would be no need for a resurrection. But then lastly, there's the perfection of the resurrection. Jesus said to Martha, whoever believes on him, though he dies, Yet shall he live and never die. You see, the end of that story in the, the end of that story in Revelation chapter twenty says this. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is he who is part of the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. A thousand years. Revelation 21 verse 4 speaks of the new heaven and the new earth. It says, it describes it this way, that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, 
for the former things have passed away. That is what awaits those who have believed, who have trusted wholly and exclusively and personally on the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, who believe that Jesus rose again from the dead for them. You see, those who die in this life in Christ will rise again according to Christ's power to eternal life. We shall reign with him, the Bible says, as priests. And we'll be in perfect fellowship with our God. And God says to us, he says, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my people. The resurrection of Christ is the most significant an important event in all of human history. It brought life into this world. It brings life into those who trust and who believe. And so for those of us who do believe, there is hope and there is life in this world and the next. And this Easter, as we are now forced to consider more serious things, would, would you, I, I would pray that you would consider where you stand with the resurrected Christ. Do you know the power of his resurrection? Have you had a heart that's been transformed by the, the power of Christ? If not, Christ calls you to believe. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And uh, Lord, we pray that for whoever's watching and wherever they are, that you would meet them where they're at. Lord, I thank you so much for the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Christ. And Lord, we affirm this morning that we believe. We believe that he rose again from the dead. We believe that he has the power over death and over sin and over Satan. And we believe that those who are in Christ shall not taste death. This gives us tremendous hope. And tremendous courage. And so I pray if there's someone watching or listening who does not know the Savior, God, I ask that you would draw them by your gracious hand to yourself. That the God who is rich in mercy would extend and breathe life into their soul so that they may get up and walk in this newness of life. Father, may you be glorified by all that is said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song is Because He Lives. Let's sing this wonderful song together. God sent His Son They called Him Jesus He came to
thank you for joining us today on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. But before we do close, I want to ask you the question that Ryan asked you as well. Do you know this Jesus who died for our sins and rose again? Are you sure that he is your Savior and your Lord? And I hope that you can say, I am sure of that. I have peace with God. But if you're not sure, then I would encourage you to contact us here at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Glenwood. Go to our church website, perhaps, emmanuel.org.au, and send us a note and ask us for more information, and we'd love to send you some information that can help you to be sure that Jesus is your Savior and your Lord. It's about the peace with God. It's about knowing him, knowing his peace day by day, and one day knowing that we have the assurance that when this life is over, we shall be forever with the Lord. And so shall we close with prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you so much for this privilege that has been ours on this beautiful resurrection morning to remember the one to whom we owe everything, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, that he, the eternal God, would take on humanity, human flesh, that he would live that sinless life and die for our sins upon that cross, and that he would then rise again, defeating sin and death, so that we could know peace with our eternal God, forgiveness of sins, so that we could one day forever be with our Lord. And now may the grace of God, the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, might he make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you.